all interviews, I, and then when we send them the recording, and I'm sorry, when we send the link, the person just yeah. double click in the link and we are on it. So I'm not, yeah. not sure. I don't know. All right, Dr. Uh, Gleason, thank you. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, okay, right. and call me, call me Patrick. <laughs> I don't need the doctor. I'll oh, tell you, you a story. I'll tell you a story about that, the doctor, if, you, if we have time. I uh, give yeah. Give me one minute. Let me get my um, uh, okay. I'm not going to call you. Uh, uh, call me Patrick. Okay, gotcha. So, uh, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, Hi, uh, Patrick. Listen, uh, my name is Claudio. I'm calling you from DC. Uh, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners uh, from the students in Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that. Patrick Gleason accepted our invitation to our show. Patrick Gleason is an American musician, synthesizer, pioneer, composer, and producer. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. <laughs> glad we're here. I'm glad. Same, same here. So um, I will ask you some questions, but I call it uh, more than a conversation about music and soundtrack and jazz, a little bit more than an interview. And you can feel yeah. free to ask me a question as well. We sure. You know, Christian and I, with some friends, um, when the pandemic, uh, we decided some months ago to uh, open one online registration, and then I opened another one, and I opened a third one, and now I'm putting together a fourth one, and, and we like this stuff. Uh, oh. Things uh, for me, music is very important to me. I I, I grew, grew up in a family where my dad did have a lot of music, so... Um, although I don't play an instrument, I don't know how to read music at all. I just like listening yeah. to music, buy a lot in all different areas, and we decided it was a good way to do this stuff. So, uh, so doc, uh, keep on calling you, Dr. Cliff. You, well, I, let, 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 let's stop right there and let me explain about the doctor, okay? Okay, I, gotcha. I, I do have a, a doctor's degree. I got a PhD in 18th century English literature. Nothing to do right. with music. I, when I was teaching, I taught for eight years. Yeah. When I was teaching, I never used the doctorate. It was considered, you know, it, it was like reverse snobbery. Uh, at Harvard, all the doctors are called Mr. So by God, we're going to call ourselves Mr. as well. So I never used the doctor when I was teaching. When I got into, into Herbie Hancock's band in 1971 and we went out on the road, he would always introduce both me and Eddie Henderson, the trumpet player, as Dr. Henderson and Dr. Gleason. I never asked Herbie why that was, but after having been on the road for a while, I understood. He was, it was a, it was a very, Herbie's a very po politic, genial, strategic guy. What he was telling the audience without having to say so is, uh, <clears throat> this is just to remind you, we're not six Negroes and a hippie parading around the country. We're persons of substance. Our trumpet player has got a medical degree and the synthesizer player has uh, a, a PhD. So please understand when you see a jazz band, th these are just not some random guys that got together. This is something valid and important. So that's how the, I got the doctorate. Once I got out of the band, I tried to drop the doctorate. People wouldn't recognize that I was Patrick Gleason, the synthesizer player, until I told him, no, no, I, yes, I am. He said, but you're not Dr. Gleason. No, oh, I actually, yes, I'm also Dr. Gleason. But today, let's just cloud your you, Patrick. Yeah. Will do. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. So I have very respect for you. I mean, I, I'm like yourself, I'm well educated myself and I, I got lucky on the way as well. No PhD, but I, I have done well. Yeah. Uh, um, so this has been a weird year for everybody, um, Patrick, uh, with with the pandemic and not be able to tour. And I know you have a tree or two. Um, how it is affecting your creativity? Is still new? You compose music. You you write music as well. Oh yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I I see myself as equally a, a composer and a performer. And yeah. so during during the, the pandemic, I've I've started a quadraphonic album, a solo album. Uh, I'm doing it with a brilliant guy 
who has actually developed special software to be able to enable persons to take a vinyl quadraphonic album, put it on a stereo turntable, and then use his special hardware to connect to two more speakers, and they can listen to quadraphonic music on a stereo turntable. So oh my God, man. Yeah, no, he, he's a he's a, he's a very 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 bright guy. So early in his life, he was a C-suite member of a major corporation, and left because it wasn't what he was interested in. But he left with a lot of money. So. Now, the rest of his life, he's doing what he wants. And one of the things he's doing is producing quadraphonic music. His first album was Suzanne Ciani's brilliant album. And now he's doing mine. So that's what I've been doing during the, the pandemic is this quadraphonic album. Man, I'm, we'll talk more about that because that would be very interesting talking to him as well. Uh, yeah. I, for me, I'm a, I'm a computer engineer, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So technology is very important to me. Uh, but in many ways, music is my passion, right? So computer science paid the bills, but music is, is what I really like to do. Yeah. Um, give me a lot of the So wh were you born like in a musical family or when you started playing the piano? Uh, no, uh, my dad I had a, a small business, a, a, a small loan company in Seattle. My mom was a, uh, they were, was a housekeeper, uh, I mean, housewife. And uh, they were both Irish immigrants. So there was no arts background there at all. But um, I don't know what happened, but I started taking piano lessons when I was six. By the time I was in the third grade, so I'd be about nine, I'd fallen in love with jazz. I mean, it was something I just, just I really responded to deeply. And uh, my parents were to a degree encouraging. So they, they, I wanted to buy Mary Lou Williams, a great uh, uh, African-American woman jazz pianist. I wanted to buy her little series of, of uh, books uh, for, for young people. So by the third grade, I was playing out of Mary Lou Williams song books and so forth. Started going to, to jazz uh, concerts and, and clubs uh, when I was, I guess, <laughs> 14 or 15, uh, we would go, my, my best friend and I would go down and we would go to one of these, they were called race clubs, if you can believe that, in, in Seattle. We'd go down to one of these, quote, race clubs, and I, the, they would get to know us, so we'd have to stand around for a couple of weeks before they <laughs> would let us in sometimes. Then they got to know us and would let us in, but they'd say, you know, now you guys can go in, but you don't talk to anybody. You sit down and above all, don't order a drink. <laughs> so, so, so we would go to these clubs and I got to know a lot of the, the jazz musicians in Seattle because, through that. But I, I just, uh, something, it, it just hit me. It was a very, I don't know what to say, life fulfilling art form, you know. And, and then you continue taking, I read on your kind of biography that you continue with the classic yes. classes, but kind of was a conflict of interest between the teacher. You wanted to learn jazz. She told you, no, no forget about jazz, do the classical. Yeah. Your parents say, well, you one or the other, and stuff yeah. like that, right? Well, I think my parents were, were that was a, a little bit of a reach for me to start taking jazz piano. I don't know that it was the race my 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 the, the teacher i would have had was was african-american uh i think it was also that they were concerned about the fact that this was going to divert my attention away from doing what they wanted me to do which was to become a medical doctor doesn't that, doesn't every immigrant parent want their child to become a medical doctor oh <laughs> you know well, we, 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 you know, I, you want, you asked me the question? Yeah. You want me to answer? Yeah. Um, so I'm an immigrant like, like your parents, right? So I'm the first generation immigrant. I came from Santiago, Chile, right? Mm -hmm. South America. And my son was born here in Boston when I went, when I was going to school and so forth. So it's kind of the, the, the role of the parents, right? Is to help them 
accomplish their dream. Yes. Instead of imposing dreams on them. Mm -hmm. but I, I have, I have, I have three master degrees from Harvard, so I, I have done well in my life. Uh -huh. And and I I think um, in my case, I was a very very poor student. Believe it or not, before when I was growing in South America. And uh -huh. then when I came here, I got lucky along the way. I was able to come here. I was very poor. I worked very hard. I went step by step, and I did have done well from myself and from my family. But it needs to come from you. It doesn't need to come from the parents, right? It, uh, right, that's right. That, by, uh, But I, I, I agree with... Because th there's people... You know, they're bringing all different people with different uh, and so forth. And it needs to come from within, right? So if, if my son want to be, you know, a bum, right? We'll say no, because the schooling is important in life, right? Without college degree, it's very difficult to make it, right? Yeah. But but I wouldn't say, well, law is better than engineering or engineering is better than medical. You yeah. need to do what you like it, you know, uh, do two, three degrees, whatever you like. And, right. and, and 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 find your way in the world, whatever that means to you, not not to me, right? Yes. Eventually, you will go on your own, and you need to do well in life. So work hard, be a decent person, try people well, don't discriminate, try to do the right thing in life. Yeah. Those are um, my opinion. Clouds have been on the role of the parents. So. Yes, but you you're you're uh, better educated and and culturally more sophisticated person than my parents were. I, I got lucky on the way, doctor. Yeah. Sorry. But you know, I got everybody's smart or everybody's an idiot. It, yeah. It's the person, the perseverance, the consistency and the hard work and yeah. Yeah. Everybody's sharp. But they were I, th my parents I think were worried that, you know, if I were to become a musician that I would never be able to have a middle class income and and be right. a person. Yeah. You know. So that was their worry. And and it was a, 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 a you know a kind of a point of contention between my me and my parents for a long time. And one time, I was by this time I'm like forty years old or something. And I'm sitting at the breakfast table with my mother. I'm visiting them in Seattle. My mother looks up and she says, "Your your father tells me that you make more money than he does." <laughs> I looked at my mother. I said, "Well, I, I don't know, Mom. I'm I, I don't know how much Dad makes, but it's possible." And she says, "Hmm." She sort of starts fingering her silverware <laughs> nervously. She said, mm, "Well, that's what he says." So <laughs> from that point on, there was no problem with my being a musician. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, of course. Obviously, the parents. I want my son to do better than I yeah. did, and and so yeah. because for me. Uh, Patrick, when I came here, I was very poor, right? So I, I went, I got lucky on the way. People helped me, and I worked my tail off, right, to be where yeah. I am. But of course, you you want the kids, the next generation, to be better, right? Yes. And uh, so it, at the time, you were right. So you, you, your piano teacher say, no, 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 piano is the only. Way. I mean, classical music is the only way to make it. Forget yeah. about Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and all the nonsense. No, yeah. not really, but. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's the way. I'm not. I'm not teaching you jazz. I'm teaching yeah. you jazz, right? right. So they and your parents say, well, jazz. I mean, classical is the only way. The way. So either you take it, you leave it, right? Or and I left it. I, I. It made. It made me so discouraged that I quit playing the piano. I quit studying for. Oh gosh. 15 years. 15 years or so, right? For whatever. Yeah. 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 So, um, but then the 60s came along and, you know, everything that happened in the 60s, people are, you know, going a little bit crazy in this country. And um, now I'm, I'm finding myself attracted to, to music again. And I remember one night I was sitting in my living room listening to Bartok's first violin concerto. And it just struck me like, like a bolt of lightning. My God, what am I doing teaching English literature? This is the only thing I want to do in life is to make music. So from that point on, I transitioned back to being a full-time musician. And, and, and again, you, I was very lucky because it happened at a time when it was easy or easier to do that. I mean, uh, 
I, you know, I, I, I just happened to be in the town where the, the first operative analog synthesizer had been built. I mean, it was actually in Oakland, Don Buchla's. And I was able to get time on the Buchla and learn the synthesizer on the Buchla. And uh, a year later, I had quit teaching and was making a living uh, doing, you know, local ads and PBS um, scores for PBS shows, which don't pay very much money. And then uh, I started doing overdubs for Jefferson Airplane and uh, uh, let's see who else. Um, oh gosh, um, I'm trying to think of all, there were, there were about five or six groups I worked for. And then I ran into a producer, David Rubinson and David was going to take over and become Herbie's producer. As it happened, I'd been putting on Bitches Brew, which was a great transitional album of Miles Davis that really took us from one era of jazz to the next. I'd been putting Bitches Brew on my 16 track recorder at night after the last session. I had a little recording studio by that time and I would overdub since. So I said to David, I can do this. I can do, I can, I can play this music. So <laughs> David understandably was a little skeptical. I mean, here's a guy who's never recorded on a, a real record and he wants to join Herbie Hancock. So David told Herbie, he said, no, look, this guy isn't really a musician. He, he knows a lot about the synthesizer. Why don't you go over to his studio and he can set the synthesizer up for you and you can play it. So Herbie came over and uh, I had everything all set up and I'm, my engineer was there and I was out in the studio with the synth and Herbie came out with me. And so we started listening to the first cut of, of his album Crossings. He said, we're in about 15 seconds. He said, no, I hear something there. I said, okay. So I start patching my Moog 3, the big modular Moog, and I'm going as fast as I can. I'm thinking this guy's going to be impatient with this process and he's going to leave and this is going to be the end of the opportunity. So I was just really going as fast as I could. I finished the patch and I turned to Herbie and I said, okay, I'm ready. He said, did you record it? Uh, I said, well, no, I, I'm, you're going to record it. He said, you're doing fine. You just record it. And so I, I recorded it. So we went on that way. And every time I asked him to play it, he said, no, no, you, you do it. You're doing fine. After about an hour, he said, you know what? I have some shopping to do. Uh, why don't you just keep going and I'll come back later. So he didn't come back until the next afternoon. I worked all the rest of that day, all through the night and all through the next morning until by, um, Two o'clock in the afternoon, I'd overdubbed half the album. <laughs> and when he came back, that was it. And I didn't know, I mean, I knew he liked it, but I didn't know how much he liked it. And then about, we finished the album and then about, uh, oh gosh, two or three months later, I got a phone call and um, uh, some secretary of David said, uh, Hurry would like to speak to you. So Herbie got on the phone. He said, he said, Pat, he said, how would you like to join the band? Wow. <laughs> what? So that was, that was how my career started. Hmm. Tell, tell the story about, I read somewhere that uh, when you started, uh, your dad lent you 20 grand to buy. Uh, oh, yeah. Three. Which yeah. is 20 grand at the time, not right now, it's a lot of money. Back yeah. then, was, oh, yeah, but it, was, it would be, it would be like, I would say, I mean, remember, this is like the 60s, so this would be probably like a hundred to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in today. You went, you went to your dad, dad, I'm sort of done with teaching, music is my calling. Mm -hmm. Trust me, let me give it a try, something yeah. like that, right? Yeah, he, he was, he was suspicious. But he said, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I won't lend you the money. I'll give you the money. So, <laughs> so because that way he knew if, if I failed, if I couldn't pay him back, that it, it wouldn't be a failure. It would just, 
you know, so if he'd given me the money, then there was no obligation and hence no possibility of my failing. I think he wanted to make sure that this didn't become a problem between the two of us. So anyway, he lent me the money and that, that was the money I used to start Different Fur, the studio, which by the way is still going today. Yeah, I will ask you about that stuff too. So you, then, so you, you began, you began doing, so you left teaching, right? You left academia, you start doing work for some people, you began doing your career, you went to your dad and said, well, I've been doing this for two years, I'm earning an income, I'm not starting yeah. from zero. But yeah. show, let me show you who I'm working, play. The dad said, okay, here's the money, <laughs> don't screw up. Yeah. And then you you did you began doing well for yourself, right? So yeah, that's right. And then you ever pay the money back or, or what they, they, they oh no. <laughs> he didn't. I mean it was a gift. And but it was I a did, psychological did, gift, right? Huh? In in a way that he gave you the money, but psychological said, I need to make it happen. There's no way around, right? No yeah, my, my my way of, of paying him back was to succeed. To succeed, exactly. That's the correct yeah. word. Yeah. And then so then you so you began and when you realized that you needed to get like a a track recording studio and then the 16 how how was what's the transition between the moog and and then the well i i loved the, the moog it was a really uh, good instrument um bob moog was a very interesting guy a really likable guy and uh and very human and uh, moog synthesizers kind of reflected his humanity and they weren't perfect, but they were very soulful. And so I, I was very happy with that instrument, but I knew I couldn't take it on the road with Herbie. I mean, if you're in a huge rock group and you have one roadie that just handles your Moog synthesizer uh, the way uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer had, yeah. then, then that's gonna be fine. But w there's seven of us uh, and one roadie so that's not going to work. So I needed to find another synthesizer. And fortunately, I, just about that time, Alan Perlman came out with the ARP 2600, which is what I used with Herbie. Yeah, a really a kind of a, a instrument that's about halfway between a preset and a full modular, but it was very flexible. You could do probably 90% of what you could do on a Moog, you could do on the little 2600. Yeah. Wow. And then, so from there, how you how the studio came about? You got the eight track, and then from well, uh, what happened was I, I ran into a guy who already had a Moog synthesizer, a small one. Yeah, and I said to him, "Look, I'll I'll put in some money, and we'll make this a full sized Moog, and then we can make some money doing local ads and whatever you you know comes up." So we needed a place and um, uh, a young guy that was doing some jobs, sort of odd jobs for, for my friend, uh, found this little, uh, really kind of abandoned uh, little warehouse in the Mission District. And, um, and that, we, which we were able to buy for $25,000. And by the way, the, the, the man who owns it now two years ago, turned down $5 million. And then they came, the same people came back and said, okay, we'll give you 8 million. And he said, no. <laughs> so 25,000 to 8 million. And it was a rundown place, right? Like a warehouse, right? There. It was a little, 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 it was a beautiful little building though. It was all Redwood. Yeah. And at that time, if, 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 the redwood had a knot in it. They just tossed that away. So the the whole building was built with absolutely prime quality redwood, and uh, it was it was a it turned out to be the perfect place for our studio. And then you went to some sort of training to become like a sound engineer, or you kind of <laughs> learn on the ball? No, no, it's the, it's the 60s, Claudio. Everybody, quote, does their own thing. You remember that phrase? Do yeah. your own thing. Well, everybody does their own thing, which means a lot of people in this country were running around doing stuff. They had no idea of what they were doing. And that was, we were that in that group because we knew nothing. I mean, I mean, you know, we knew what an average adult would know about recording, which is very little. That's all we really knew. 
So, but we just, we just made it up as we went along. We made a lot of mistakes. Um, the, the, as, as a sort of smart aleck uh, gesture, we, we put fur on, on, the, on the console, you know, the, the little board you lean on at the, at, the, at the foot of the console. We covered that in fur. And one day, day, when we started having customers, a guy who knew more than we did came in and he said, uh, he rubs the fur, he said, that creates static electricity. He said, that's not really a good idea in a recording studio. So, I mean, we, we proceeded from a, a state of complete ignorance and just sort of made it up as we went along. But, you know, all the, all the San Francisco rock groups, it was the same thing. I mean, two years ago, these guys didn't even play a guitar. Now they've got a contract with Warner Brothers. So right. it was like that, you know. And um, then I ran into a guy, John Stork, who was the studio designer for that era. He did uh, Electric Lady Land, Jimi Hendrix Studio in New York, many other studios. And um, I told him, I don't have any money. I can't, he told me what he charged. I think it was a hundred thousand dollars. And I said, I, I, he said, okay, I'll tell you what. He said, I'm gonna be out in San Francisco in a few months. When I'm out there, I'll come over and I'll give you a little sketch and you can finish the studio from my sketch. Well, what happened was he came over it's, it's, again, it's the 60s. Uh, we snort, snort a little Coke together. We drink some red wine together and ended up spending four days designing my studio. <laughs> so when he left, I had a John Stork studio, which was a big deal. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, and then, so what are the, the bands or names that end up being the first oh, year? Or different for? That you recorded, right? So... Yeah, they were big names, right? Hmm? They Same. were big names of the people that you guys record. Oh my God! Recorded uh, the first two years to three Stevie years. Stevie Wonder, uh, uh, Jefferson's uh, Airplane. Uh, 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 um, let me pull up the list if I can find the list. No, yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll do it from memory. It will take too long. We we had everybody. I mean, we had the, the biggest names in uh, R and B. And the biggest names in jazz, we had uh, the biggest names in the movie business. I mean, we had uh, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, yeah, I mean, we, <laughs> um, yeah, it was a very, very successful studio. And I think the reason for the success was it was never really about, well, two things. First of all, it was never really about the money. So we were always, we're very, very competitive. In fact, it, it, we, we really worried the established recording establishment. When I told them uh, at an AES meeting, one of them asked me what I was going to charge. And I said, oh, 25 an hour. And these guys were charging $100 an hour for an eight track. And what we were going to do, we were going to do 16 track for 25 an hour. And the guy said, oh, please don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> but so that we did that. And then the other things that, that brought people to us was, um, as I say, everybody that was at different for that worked there was there because they loved music. And S Susan Skaggs, who came on to be the studio manager, loved music. She loved musicians. She was a warm, mothering, but also very funny and hip person. And people liked being around her. So people would come and they would end up spending more time and therefore more money than they even intended just because yeah. they liked being there. Francis wow. Coppola, when he came over, he was there about two days and he said, um, he said I'm kind of sleepy. He said, um, is there any place I can sleep? I said, well, my, my uh, apartment is on the third floor. So he would go, he started going up. He would come in, work, look at what we were doing for a while and he'd go upstairs and take a nap in my... In my apartment. So it was like that. It was very um, neighborly, I guess you'd say. Wow. Yeah. What, what year are we talking about now? Well, uh, the studio went online in 1968. Mm -hmm. And uh, and by 
19, certainly by the time I came back from Herbie, which was in 1973, by that time, the studio was running day and night. It really would run uh, 20 hours a day, and then we'd have four days for cleaning and and uh, any audio repairs that needed to be made. Yeah. So, so you were doing well financially. Somebody, well, somebody else was managing the studio, and then you were touring with, yeah, with Herbie and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And and then so great. I, I look at the list the other day, and Big names were recorded there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people that I've recorded. You know, yeah, yeah, I've yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> one guy, I was actually, I think, a little surprised when he arrived because he, <clears throat> everybody was telling him, "Oh no, this, if you, if you, we're going to do synth work, you got to go to a different fur." So he'd imagined some big corporate establishment. So, you know, the, the mission district at the time is, you know, kind of a, almost a ghetto. I mean, it's a, a lower working class at, uh, uh, um, uh, neighborhood. Um, and so the studio is not large. And I think he was kind of shocked when he, he got here and looked around. He wasn't sure this was going to work out, but it did. And then eventually you end up failing the stuff, right? Yeah, because why? Sorry for well, my... because the very success of the studio meant that um, it was taking time and energy away from what I wanted to do, which is record. Yeah, we play music. I wanted to compose. I wanted compose, to compose yeah. and 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 make my own music. Uh, well, I, I, I didn't make my own music. I made music for others still, but I was able to get into the film and, and television industry and work as a uh, composer there for, I did that for about 30 years. But I, I didn't want to spend energy dealing with all the, I mean, running a studio is a very, very work intensive process because it's like any other business, but it's, it's, you know, most businesses, you don't have to go in and recalibrate the whole system every day. You know, and, and I mean, we have a, we had a single room, we had 10 employees to, to service that one room. So it's, you know, and then there's a lot of overhead and I just seem like, no, this is not what I wanted to do. And I know Susan Skaggs, who was the studio manager, she, she told me when she came in, she had worked for David Rubinson and she said, I'll come over to you and run your studio, but I want you to promise me something. If you ever decide to sell it, you'll give me a chance to buy it. So time came along and uh, I said, Susan, I, I really kind of want out. And I said, what can you do? She said, well, I, I don't have any money. I said, okay. So I sold her the, the studio for eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I think, and I and nothing down. I said, "I'll give you ten years to pay it off. Just send me a check every month." They never missed a check, not in ten years. So ten thousand, so eighty every year, right? For eight thousand. Yeah, yeah. And um, and well, you were well. I, I I'm thinking about your dad, right? So <laughs> kind of you 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 did. In a way, what your dad did to you, right? So you yeah. helped you helped somebody along the way that you knew that was responsible, manage your studio for yeah. two years or five years, and sure, yeah. Sadly, Stu, uh, Susan is gone. She got uh, early onset Alzheimer's, so she's gone. But Howard Johnson, our head engineer, is still doing well and still recording. Yeah, and then went from her to another guy that ended up buying it. Yeah, there were two. There were two people afterward, or maybe even three. But two, two until we got to Patrick Brown, it didn't count. Nobody really understood. I would say the spirit of that studio until we got to Patrick Brown. Patrick Brown bought it, I think, for I think a million and a half. They went for eight hundred to a million. And a half. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I think Susan and Howard sold it for a million two. And um, and then Patrick Brown got it, and Patrick Brown is not in it for the money. I mean, my God, if you want, if we're in it for the money, and somebody offered you eight million dollars, you would grab it and get onto your retirement island and begin drinking mai tais. 
<laughs> but he turned them down because they weren't really interested in the studio. By this time, this what used to be a little Latin ghetto has become the most hip and fashionable district in San Francisco. Property is extremely expensive and people are buying multi-million dollar condos. That's crazy how people can afford this stuff. Oh my God. I don't understand the way. Patrick, when I visited Patrick, he, we were talking about this, you know, about how everything had escalated. He says, come here, I want to show you something. So we walked out into the street. He said, see, pointed down to the corner. He said, see that building on the corner? I said, yeah. He said, okay, they've just sold the upper, the second floor uh, apartment, a condo. And uh, he said, they, they've sold it for two and a half million dollars and it doesn't even have a garage. <laughs> you have to find you, a parking place on the street. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Crazy. Uh, I don't understand that. Yeah. So the guy, the new guy, is doing well. It, but he's it making a good living. I mean, it's very good money that they... Yeah, yeah he's very good at what he does. He's, yeah. and he, and to me, he embodies the spirit because he's not really in it for the money. He's in it for the music. I mean, he wants to be successful. He's very ambitious, but he wants to be successful as a studio owner and as a producer. He's a very good producer. Yeah, and I'm quite sure that it's very expensive to produce a record and the people, I don't know how much they charge you for to put an album together or uh, for the studio hours. It's, it's not cheap, it, you know, it's no, less than five cheap. bucks an hour. Yeah, it's not cheap. 500 or whatever, so, so it's... But you know, I mean, Different Fur is one of the last surviving studios because what's happened is Technology has made it more and more possible to do so. Musicians who are successful build their own studio in their house. Like here, so, right? In the, in the basement of my house, right? Yeah. Right. So uh, most of the big studios that were around in the 60s that we were competing with are all gone. Different Fur is one of the few that survives. Different Fur and I think some successor to Wally Hyder. Wally Hyder had a studio that was also very Wait, why, why, why do you think that he's still alive? Why he thinks the business is still around? It, it's very well at what he does. He's very good at what he does. It's yeah, yeah. At a certain level, I think um, you one accepts the fact that you can't do everything as well as it can be done. So you can make music full time, or you can be an engineer full time. You can't do both full time. So I, I think as musicians become more successful, they are more and more open and even want a really competent producer or engineer to come in and, and participate. I mean, the, the quad album that I'm doing, um, with his name is Cameron, Cameron V, another, well, child of immigrant. His parents are Iranian. Um, Cameron, as I say, developed all this quadraphonic expertise. So when it came time for us to do the album together, I said, Cameron, look at it. I'm going to send you the best stereo mix I can. And you turn it into a quad album and I'll, I'll listen to it and any changes I want, I'll, I'll make. I went down when I f heard the first tune. I mean, it made me cry. It was so incredible. He said, well, it's not finished yet. There's more to do. <laughs> I said, well, you can do anything you want, but you know, this, this does it for me. So I don't want to be my own quad producer and have to, to do all, learn all the expertise, the new expertise it, it takes to do a quadraphonic album from an engineering standpoint. I'll do it from the musical standpoint, but I'm very happy to have a good engineer and producer there to do what, I can't do as well as he can. Yeah, I got you. I think the other big reason he didn't accept the eight million dollar because they knew that they are not interested in the in the music, right? They will buy the building, the warehouse, whatever. They will turn down and create condos. That's it. So that's the reason. So the money didn't mean anything. It would have been very different, like a person who commit yourself. No, I want to do music because whatever. Yeah. Yeah, he will. He would be talking to her because Amy. He, he might do it or he might not. I mean, I don't know ex why the guy is so indifferent to to money. I have a couple of friends. Um, I, I hope I'm not uh, revealing something too personal. Uh, no, 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 no. Old, don't say the name. 
an old, well, I mean, it's not on my behalf. An old friend of mine is Lenny Pickett, who is the musical director for Saturday Night Live. Uh, Lenny is completely uninterested in money. I mean, I don't know how much the guy makes a week. 20000 a week? I mean, you know, he's the musical director of Saturday Night Live. He's had this incredible career. He's recorded with David Bowie. He's recorded with, with um, uh, um, what's his name from the Beatles? Uh, his name escapes me. <laughs> but, I mean, he's, he's, he's gone on the road with the biggest names, and now he's had this job for, gosh, 25 years. He's been the musical director of Saturday Night Live. The guy lives in the same apartment he lived in when he took the gig. He does not own a car. He t he takes the if he either takes uh, the subway to work, or if he's got his musical instruments with him, he'll take a cab. He's not interested in money. I mean, I think often really good musicians are so totally engrossed in the process of making music, that everything else is relatively unimportant. Family, yes, but beyond family, that's it. And I, Lenny is just not interested in money. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's funny. Wow. So then, how long did you, after you put your, in 1978, Beyond beyond the Sun and the, the, the one in 1977, the, the Star Wars, what year are we talking about? When do you, what year do you end up selling your, your studio? Oh, uh, just about that time. Um, 75? So. I think it, it was kind of a long, drawn-out process because Susan got all, she wanted it all in writing and, and made formal and so forth and so on. So she hired a lawyer to do that. The lawyer was one of these guys that could just nitpick over whether it should say which or that. <laughs> you know, so it took to create the contract took, I think I, 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 I moved into my new house in 81. And I don't think that the studio was finally sold until 83. I mean, I had just turned it over to them. Effectively, they were, it was their studio, but it formally wasn't theirs until about 83. Yeah. So, but so before 83, so then you released the, Beyond the Sun and uh, Star Wars and then Rainbow Data, right? Or so, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why? So what's the transition between jazz and soundtrack and OST that what, how you end up doing that kind of electronic music a little bit, soundtrack? Well, how did it happen it, from jazz? From, for Harry I, I, I really fell in love with synthesizers, when, with, with Don Buchla's synthesizer, which I started using at Mills College in 1966 or 67. It was the very first analog synthesizer, I believe. It was even before Bob's first instrument, Bob Moke's first instrument. So I, I would, I would, I, I'm very fascinated with electronic music and, and with electronic music making. Um, now, the reason I, I, I did Beyond the Sun, finally, I think, I so, was in love with Wendy Carlos's music. I mean, she's just an amazing, unique musician. And switched on Bach. Uh, I don't think people much listen to it anymore. They ought to. It's it's funny. I, I, I have the the first and the second and the third. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's funny. It's elegant. It's extremely musical. And I think I I, I thought oh, I'll I'll do something like that. I feel, and, and Wendy liked it. In fact, she said uh, people always, had always wanted her to do uh, Holst's Planets, which is what that piece is based on. And she said, no, Pat has already done it. I don't need to do it. So, wow. yeah, so, um, and she wrote the liner notes for my, for, for, the, for Beyond the Sun. So, I, I think it was my love of Wendy's music. I wanted to do something like this. It's like me too. I feel finally, no, there actually was only one person who ever did that at a certain level, and that was Wendy. Everybody else, including me, that did it, we did it with varying degrees of success, but Wendy was the only person, I think, that, that really 
captured every possibility in that music. So that was a, something I, I was interested in doing. And I took one more crack at it when I got my first digital uh, synthesizer and I did uh, Vivaldi, um, The Four Seasons. And I, I would say about that piece that, um, you know, it's, it's good. Um,